Hi, and welcome back to the Pilot in Command webinar series. As some of you may know, ForeFlight is partnering with AOPA and Jeppesen to bring you monthly educational webinars covering a range of topics that will help you get the most out of ForeFlight and Jeppesen. This month's topic is decision making and in flight safety. Before we get started, we just want to let you know that you can submit questions throughout the interview and we will try to answer everyone's questions at the very end. If you missed a section of the webinar or you want to watch it again, we will be uploading this video along with previous and future webinars at foreflight.com PIC. First, we are going to watch our presenter Phil Inman of our customer success team interview Richard McSpadden, the executive director of the AOPA Air Safety Institute. After that, we will go through some features that ForeFlight has that can improve your ability to make good decisions in the air and on the ground. Last, we will have a live Q&A where we answer some viewer questions. So without further ado, here is Phil Inman and Richard McSpadden. Okay, good morning. We have Richard McSpadden with us. Richard, as everybody probably knows, is the executive director of the AOPA Safety Institute. And he's joining us and has a few words. We have some questions for him. Uh, consistent with the uh, theme of our webinar today on decision making and in flight safety. So, Richard, welcome. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, for those of us that may not be completely familiar with your background, especially as it relates to aviation and your role in AOPA, maybe you could take a minute and, and uh, kind of give us the highlights. Yeah, happy to. Uh, hi, Phil. Uh, nice to see you again. Nice to chat with you. Um, I've been with AOPA uh, a little over three years now, uh, running the Air Safety Institute. And um, I got my start flying GA in college. And uh, then after that, went into the military. I flew fighters in the military for a while and a uh, short stint flying King Airs for a bit in the Philippines. And then um, I uh, left the Air Force and worked in industry for a dozen years or so in the IT industry and, and then joined AOPA and flying GA throughout all of that. So uh, delighted to be here with you th this morning. Well, thank you. And, and it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, let, why don't we just jump into the uh, theme of what we're talking about? And I think something that uh, we're going to use the opportunity having you here with us to kind of update on where we are in general aviation as it relates to statistics and safety. I know that is probably a large focus of your job and your department and uh, something that we all should be staying current with as to are we doing a good job of improving safety? Yeah, I, you're right. That is the primary focus of the Air Safety Institute um, inside of AOPA. And we've been around for about 60 years. Uh, when AOPA first started about 80 years ago, um, the, the safety was one of the very uh, early uh, focuses of, a, of AOPA and the reasons why it, it stood up. And uh, then, you know, we started the Air Safety Foundation, now the Air Safety Institute. And our job is basically to keep working to get the accident rate coming down. And that's that's what we wake up and go after every day. Are we seeing that it, it's from the literature, it seems like we're trending in the correct direction. Is that uh, continuing to be your observations as well? Yeah, I would say, Phil, that is that is a good observation. And um, if you look since the mid 90s, the fatal accident rate in general aviation has dropped some 50%. And um, that's a fantastic record. It's not enough in my mind. We still want to keep our foot on the accelerator and keep seeing the accidents, the fatal accidents especially uh, reduce. But we've made some great progress and um, and a lot more to go. Absolutely. I think all of us would agree that the the ultimate goal is that the incident rate is zero. Agreed and I it. know that's probably a little bit pie in the sky and maybe many might even characterize it as being unrealistic. But nonetheless, if we don't strive for perfection in what we do, then we'll never get there. And I'm sure that's kind of the mantra that uh, you try to advocate. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you, uh, Phil. That's the vision of the Air Safety Institute is um, we'd like to see a year without a single fatal GA accident. 
And given that 75% of accidents are, uh, are due to some type of pilot uh, action or inaction, then, uh, you know, we, we've still, we've made a lot of progress, but we can still make a lot of progress. And things like ForeFlight have made such a difference because they just directly impact so much about uh, how a pilot flies. So, you know, the, the preparation, the knowledge, the situational awareness is fantastic. And that's why we awarded Jason and Tyson the uh, General Aviation Safety Award from the Air Safety Institute because of the phenomenal impact that ForeFlight has had on safety. Absolutely. And, and I know that uh, the evolution of, of uh, ForeFlight and products of the technological nature have been a real uh, evolution in aviation in the last, uh, let's say, decade. And uh, the vision that those two gentlemen have had and probably even more so their ability to implement the vision. I mean, there are lots of people in this world that have visions to do something, but making it happen, and uh, especially in an environment such as aviation that uh, has a tendency to become very entrenched in tradition or, or customary ways of doing things and to basically completely shift the paradigm of how pilots view the aviation experience is probably something that they, uh, justly deserve a lot of credit for. Yeah. And, and uh, just the ongoing innovation, it just keeps coming, you know, with like the 3D vision um, is, is a good example of the airport. So the help for that is from us, from the safety standpoint, what we really still continue to see is kind of a theme that goes through most GA accidents is decision-making. And somewhere in there, that decision-making was impacted by something that was un unexpected. Either a pilot made a spontaneous decision in the moment and didn't, didn't accommodate all the factors that were involved in that particular situation, or they didn't do enough preparation to anticipate what, to anticipate what was coming down the road. And um, ForeFlight has so much information available at your fingertips that it helps pilots with that so that they're not surprised by things. And they can go into just about any situation uh, fully prepared for what they might encounter. I completely agree. I want to elaborate further on that and get your thoughts on decision making. I think most people watching this webinar probably immediately gravitate to decision making as being a in the moment thing. I've got something happening. I'm at the at the yoke. I've got to formulate a response and then execute it. Whereas in fact, decision making starts before you even get off the ground. It starts with inherent knowledge. It starts with training, practice, proficiency, equipment, culture, preparation. Could you talk maybe a little about the importance of those aspects to the decision-making process in aviation? Yeah, sure, Phil. I so agree with you on that. Um, the the decision-making, and here's the thing about aviation, even the spontaneous decision-making that, that is thrust upon you, we prepare for that so that you've done the deep analytical thinking of how you're going to react before it ever happens to you. So for the longer term preparation and decision making, the sort of premeditated decisions, those are enabled by the technologies that are available to us and the stuff that's available at your fingertips when you when you use ForeFlight right there in front of you. And now, so there's really no reason not to go into, uh, you know, these, these sort of premeditated situations fully prepared for what you're going to encounter. And now we all know aviation sometimes throws some things at you, whether or not it's an electrical failure or an engine failure or something like that. But here's the thing, we prepare for that. So we should still be thinking of our premeditated actions well before that happens. We've thought through an electrical failure. We've thought through what if our battery fails on our, on our iPad or what if our engine fails. And we can think the actions and the steps we're going to take so that in the moment, we're not having to make decisions on the fly very quickly. That's what we see in the Air Safety Institute, those spontaneous decisions where we haven't thought through them because either we haven't prepared enough or we haven't practiced enough and anticipated you know, events. Those spontaneous decisions are the ones that get us in trouble in aviation. Do you have um, anything you could share with us, maybe a little more specific? that you see in your studies and in your work that most pilots should spend more time on preparing or improving their decision-making process? 
Yeah, um, so we did a, uh, a whole seminar on why uh, good pilots make bad decisions. And it comes from, you know, how the how the human brain processes information and how we make decisions. And so um, those things show up in aviation um, in a couple of different ways. Um, and and tell me, Phil, if you think any of these things are involved in aviation, because all of these this comes from a non aviation context, right? All of these are red flags for uh, decision making for business leaders, for government leaders, for anybody. Right. A spontaneous decision is a red flag, something where you think it's been a repeat experience. And I want to talk a lot about that when I finish this list, this whole notion of I've been there, I've done that. This is something I've done before. Don't worry about it. You have an emotional attachment to the decision that you're going to make. There's a high self-interest in the decision. And then um, fatigue. Those kind of things uh, impact your decision making in insidious ways. And when we start peeling back the layers, when we look at accidents of, man, this was a very skilled pilot. Why did they make that decision? We can usually find one of those elements that was at play and the pilot just didn't recognize it. And I find that fascinating that sig sitting here at zero knots and one G, we can all look at a situation, even the pilot that was in the situation and say, what are they thinking? Why would they do that? But in the moment, for some reason, they're blinded to a better course of action. Is there any way, I, I totally agree, and I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. Is there any way that a pilot can practice or help himself overcome the closed-mindedness, the tunnel vision, or the in-the-moment tendencies that you speak of so that yeah. they, when they are actually in the moment, that they don't fall into that trap? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple good steps to to guard against. The one is, you know, we talked about the try to guard against the spontaneous decisions, right? And for the most part in aviation, there should be very few spontaneous decisions. If you're going to decide, oh, that looks pretty, why don't I drop down and fly this valley? Just hang on a second. You got the four flight right at your fingertips. Stay up at altitude, zoom out, look at the terrain down in there, take a look at the 3D view prepare yourself for the action that you want to take. Ideally, you would do it before you launch, but you can do it you know, at, at altitude if, if it came to it for that kind of scenario. And the next one is what we see um, is this notion of a repeated experience. So the way the brain operates is it likes to tag any situation it sees with something that it's seen before. And then it gives it an emotional attachment. Oh, I've been to this airport before. It went very well. We had a good time there. Therefore, it's, a, it's an easy and a good decision to go into this airport again. But the conditions may be different. So that's a real trap in aviation is this the way the human brain processes information and makes decisions is this tagging to something that we've seen that's kind of similar. We've kind of done this before. But in aviation, when is that ever the case? It's always different. So whenever we find ourselves relying on this notion of, oh, I've done this before, I've seen this before, make yourself dig deeper and say, okay, I've done it before, but what's going to be different about today? The winds are slightly different. The density altitude is slightly different. My airplane is loaded differently. Something like that. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind listening to you explain that is, are the words ego and pride. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that from a selfish perspective or directed at any one individual, but when you're in the moment and you're faced with these situations, You've got to be open to all possibility. You've got to think clearly. You use the word emotional. It has to be unemotionally. And it has to focus on the facts that you're presented with. And then you obviously have to fall back on your training and your your, your proficiency. Yeah, it's a balance, isn't it, Phil? Because on the one hand, we want pilots to be confident. We want pilots to step out knowing I can handle any situation that comes my way. I have the skills. I have the training. On the other hand, we don't want them to be cocky, right? And that's where I think you get into trouble is thinking, oh, I haven't trained in a while, but I should be okay. I can do this. Oh, I've seen somebody else do this. I can try it. I'm not fully prepared, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. That's where we get into trouble. Exactly. So before we wrap up, I want to bring it a little more towards for flight. That's the theme of our webinar. We are going to be demonstrating and talking about some tools that we have developed that are going to assist 
with that, both in the preparation process and while in the cockpit. And uh, hopefully they're going to be useful to uh, the uh, viewers of this as being things that they can put into their toolbox or their flight bag, if you will, and use uh, throughout their flight experience. I do want to bring up one topic, though, that we probably never talk about, and that is there is a time when not to be focusing on the tools where you basically have to, and I learned this on day one, you have to fly the airplane. Mm. You have to put four flight aside. You have to put all your other electronics. You have to look out the window. You have to fly the airplane, and then you navigate and communicate, and you could probably add mess with your electronic flight bag or your charts <laughs> after that. So I don't know any parting comments along those lines about flying the airplane. Yeah, I agree with you. I consider it a ladder of priorities, Phil. So, you know, first and foremost, you have to always have flying airspeed and a clear flight path. And once you have flying airspeed and a clear flight path, then you put your airplane in the space that it needs to be, airspace or whatever, and then you can talk to whomever. And once you've got all those met, then you've earned the right to go heads down or heads inside and work the the uh, technologies that we bought, the advances that we make that make it so much in flying so enjoyable and in many cases easier, help our decision making. But you got to earn the right to do that by working your way up that priority ladder. And if at ever any point you have task saturation or stress, work back down that ladder and make sure you've got those uh, you earn your way up it. Excellent way to put it. Uh, four flight becomes part of your scan, but it doesn't become your entire scan. And uh, there are times when it needs to be eliminated from your scan. And I like the way you uh, kind of gave it a priority list there. Hey, Phil, can I add one thing about decision making that I wanted to stress? And that is what we've also learned uh, in the Air Safety Institute is that the initial decision, and this is backed up by research and how humans make decisions, that initial decision you make is so very important because we as humans are reluctant to override a decision we've already made. It takes a lot of mental effort to make a complicated decision. And the brain's like every other muscle in the body. Once we make the decision, the brain wants to leave it alone. It doesn't want to go back and revisit it. So the issue with that is you've got all the tools right there available to you in ForeFlight to check the weather and the notams and everything. It's so critical that you assess that and realize that once you make that initial decision, your body moves into execution mode. And, and even though you'll get information along the way that may suggest you should revisit that decision, we're reluctant to do it. And so uh, we've got to be really careful about the preparation and understanding of how critical it is of that first decision that we make. Excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up. And so with that, uh, any final comments or thoughts, Richard, before we, we leave you? No, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you for what you do from the Air Safety Institute. Four Flight has had a huge impact on safety and helping us drive down that fatal accident rate. And uh, um, I'm so delighted uh, to be with you today and talk about it. Thanks for what you do. You're quite welcome. And uh, we thank you for being with us today and uh, look forward to being able to do one of these webinars to, on an expanded decision-making topic in the future. Look forward to it. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Richard. Many thanks to Richard McSpadden for sharing his thoughts and insights on decision making from his perspective in his many years of service to the AOPA and the Air Safety Institute. Thank you again, Richard. Let's get into the uh, heart of the webinar provided by Four Flight for decision-making and in-flight safety, as previously said. My name is Phil Inman, and we're going to cover a variety of topics tonight. In fact, we're going to cover a lot of topics today. Uh, we're not focused so much on flight planning and actual flight execution and all the steps and tools that you can use within Four Flight to do that. We've covered that in previous webinars, but we're going to focus on those features that I believe will help you in your decision-making process and enhance the safety of mission and safety of flight. So with that, an overview of what we're going to cover. These are probably the main themes that we're going to be discussing today, not necessarily in this order, 
we're going to be bouncing around and coming back to many of them through both the preparation and in-flight process. But we're going to talk a lot about pre-flight preparation. I personally, I think Richard supported this as well, and I think any seasoned pilot would tell you that decision-making and safety has a direct relationship on the amount of preparation that you put into preparing your flight. We're going to talk about procedure briefings and understand any of the requirements prior to flight that you're going to be expected to comply with during your flight. We're going to introduce you, if you have not seen already, to the takeoff and landing performance feature that we have currently built for performance subscribers. We're going to show you 3D preview. Synthetic vision is a very powerful feature that is provided in a lot of our substitutions. We're going to demonstrate that. Really does a lot towards enhancing your situational awareness. Profile view, in-flight alerts, and ADSB overlays and options to you are just the highlights. We're going to cover some other features as well. So with that, why don't we go ahead and jump into it. Pre-flight preparation could be the single most important activity that you can indulge yourself in to enhance the safety of your mission and to allow you to make better, quicker, and smarter decisions both prior to flight and during your flight. So let's talk about specifics. We're going to start with the profile. We're going to go ahead and switch over to the iPad and I'm actually going to demonstrate a lot of the things associated with the profile view and do it live on the iPad. I think most of you that have joined us today are very familiar with the layout of ForeFlight and the various overlays and features that you have available to you. We're starting basically with a blank canvas here centered in uh, the Houston, Texas area, which is very close to uh, where I live. And I want to point as you get ready to start, let's just look at a few things that apply to any flight. And if there's anything there that jumps out at you, you know, I have a, a very plain vanilla type presentation at this point in time. I've got, got the aeronautical layer turned on. But as you know, there are many different map presentations. I can view uh, chart overlays, whether they be IFR, VFR, whether they be the uh, government charts, or in this case, the Jeppesen up here at the top. I've also got on the right-hand column, and these are the ones I want to focus on, a lot of weather-related and informational type overlays that I can select. And so I want to start in the Houston, Texas area, because as I am presenting this video, we've got a lot of weather activity building out in West Texas. And so we have an opportunity to demonstrate a lot of things to us. This is our radar composite view. And we also have various other ones that we're not going to talk but with, uh, into specifics. We have enhanced satellite, we have color infrared satellite. And then as you get down, we get into things like icing, turbulence, surface analysis, and hazard advisory. In this case, we got icing overlay. We really don't see anything going on here at this point in time. But if we go to turbulence, we do have turbulence showing up. Note also on these weather overlays that we've got at the bottom a time slider. In this case, this is plus three hours out in the future. I can go to six hours, which would be 4 a.m., nine, uh, nine hours advanced, so on and so forth. And that actually moves. I can hit the play button off to the left and it will actually play on the time scale. The other thing of note is the, is the altitude slider over on the right. Right now it's selected for 10,000 feet, but I may be flying higher and be interested in the flight level up at, let's say, flight level 300. So I'll slide that up to 300 and now I have a presentation of all the turbulence layers at that and I can put that through the motion cycle as well. Very powerful feature as you plan your flight, depending on where you're going, and to look at your upper atmosphere type weather conditions such as turbulence, icing. We've got the surface analysis charts, which will take a second. We've got a front coming through Texas. 
We have hazard advisors, which have been disabled for less than 30 knots in this particular case. I want to draw attention, though, to the AirMet segment and center weather advisories here. A lot of activity going on. You notice that we've got selectors down here at the bottom. We've got icing. We've got turbulence. We can turn those off. We can go to IFR. And then we got thunderstorm, in this case, convective activity. If you want to know the details of any of these, just tap on them and you'll get a pop-up that gives you a very detailed text description of what that advisory is. This is all in the, in this case, this is in what we refer to as our AirMet Sigmet and CWA overlay panel. I think most of you probably are familiar with TFRs and so on and so forth. The flight categories are the flight categories at any particular airport. You notice that at this point in time, we do have some red uh, up in East Texas and East, uh, Southeast Oklahoma. Surface winds, winds aloft. I can cycle through these. I don't want to spend a lot of time with them. I think most of you are probably familiar with them. But if you're not, take some time. Get familiar with these. Find out how these work for you as you plan your mission, uh, regardless where you are. And obviously, sometimes weather are gonna, is going to be a much more important factor in your decision making, uh, especially if you're going to be flying uh, great distances or at higher altitudes. A short VFR hop for the $100 hamburger over to the airport three counties over may not be quite as big a deal. But I encourage you to visit the weather uh, overlays that we have provided here and get familiar with them all. Let's go back to our map. I'm gonna turn these off, go back to our map, and we're gonna, before we jump to actually planning a flight and working with a flight, I want to point out one other thing that sometimes I've got this hiding airspace above 10,000 feet in the lower right hand corner. That's a feature you can tap on that. And in this case, I happen to have that set. And what it does, it's a decluttering feature. Doesn't make your map quite so busy. But for the flights that I'm going to be flying, planning and fl executing, that's probably a little too low. So I'm going to go ahead and set that to 15,000 feet. I'm going to be flying a Cessna 182. I do not have oxygen. So we're going to be staying well below 12,000 uh, 12, feet or 11,500. But I do want to hide because I'm not going to concern myself with airspace issues going on above 15,000 feet. It's just a way to kind of simplify my flight planning process, which is probably worth noting. As you prepare yourself for a flight, if you make it more and more complex, you're going to be faced with more and more complex decisions should something stray from the norm or from the expected. So try to maintain to the appropriate level a aura of simplicity, and only you as the pilot in command can judge at what level that is. So if you're planning that two-hour VFR flight, don't make it so complex that you can't think your way out of a problem if it were to crop up. On the other hand, if you're flying cross country, that flight plan will need to be complex and you are going to have to investigate and prepare for a lot of different scenarios. Okay, the flight we're gonna plan today is going to be an interesting one. We are going to depart and I'm gonna use our flight planning box. As you see, I have a Cessna 182, tail number 182 Papa India. Uh, loaded up, and we are going to fly from 06 uniform to K Victor Echo Lima, a flight from Jackpot, Nevada, which is the northeastern corner, almost on the Nevada Idaho state line to Vernal, Utah. These are locations I've never been to. I've never even flown in Utah, so this is all new territory. And I picked this route because it's going to force us through the planning process of flying unfamiliar territory and some things that I think we need to be especially cognizant of. So if we look at this route, and we'll focus in a little more here, the first thing I want to do is I want to familiarize myself with these airports. 
So I can do two things and I am going to do two things. I'm going to go to the airport view and pull up the airport page on Jackpot Nevada. I can look at frequencies, weather, runways, uh, procedures that are available. In this case, there are none. It's a pretty simple airport out there. But one thing I do want to draw attention to is the 3D view. This is a feature that's available for performance subscribers. And if I'm going to be departing from or arriving at an airport, or possibly it would expect to have to land at an airport that I'm not familiar with, I'm going to take advantage of the 3D view and kind of get myself with a familiar with the lay of the land in this case. Well, jackpot's kind of what we expect, I think, up in northeastern Nevada. Pretty flat, arid. I'm going to take my fingers and I'm just going to kind of look around. I don't see any mountains nearby. I do see them off in the distance. I'm not certain at this point if I'm going to be taking off on 1-5 or 3-3. So I'm going to take a look at both. I can zoom in. I can kind of look from the top. I can look from an approach view. I see there's a you know, what appears to be a golf course out here to the left, so on and so forth. But I got lots of room. Flipping around to 3-3, three, three, I'm doing kind of the same thing. Now I see the golf course kind of at the departure end of the runway off to the right. If I had an emergency out procedure that I had to execute shortly upon liftoff or I couldn't or got beyond the point where I couldn't get down on the runway, this is a good way to kind of take a look and see what could I expect in the way of finding suitable places off airport to put my aircraft down. So I think the 3D view really is helpful here. Let's go by, back to the flight plan. Now we're going to pull up Bernal and we're going to do the same thing, except this case, instead of going to the airport diagram, I'm going to tap the bubble and look second from the bottom. Showing 3D view is actually an option I have. So I'm going to tap that and I get the same view, except this is for Virgin, Vernal Regional Airport in Utah. And I'm going to do the same thing. Now, this is my arrival airport. Now, I've got mountains that are much closer. It's one thing that jumps off to me. It's a single runway airport. I've got some more urban development, maybe commercial property off to the right. If I flip around and, and choose to land runway 17, that would be off on the left. It looks like I got a, a significant taxiway off to the right. And I also, by zooming around, find out who it is not a run one runway airport. I actually have a crossing runway. So I want to be prepared for that possibility. Um, pretty good tarmac over here on the right, things like that. So you're just using the 3D view to get yourself familiar with the airport. And I am going to suggest to you that the more you know about that airport upon arrival, or the more you know about an airport prior to departure, especially if you're not familiar with them, if you can use the 3D view, you will at least have the belief that you've seen it before and you'll be better prepared should you have to do something out of the ordinary. Okay, let's go back to our route. The objective of this webinar is not to do detailed route planning, but I do want to look at this and see if there's a couple things here that are of concern to us or we should pay attention to in the way of safety and possible in-flight or aeronautical decision making. The first thing that I see is after I take off from Jackpot and start heading to the southeast, I've got some airspace issues out there. I've got what appears to be some MOAs. I'm going to tap on them, and sure enough, I do have some MOAs here. And I, as you well know, I can tap on the details of these, and I can get a more descriptive information as to the effective active times and who the controlling agencies are and the altitudes that they apply to and the uh, times and so on and so forth and the frequencies if I need to communicate with somebody in air. But for the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to make things simple and I'm just going to avoid those MOAs. So I'm going to rubber band around them. I'm going to go to the north and I'm going to have a flight path such as that. I'm going to select that waypoint where I'm going to turn to the south. The next thing that jumps out is I know just from being familiar with Utah that I'm going to be crossing some mountains. This is not flat terrain in the middle like it is at my departure airport, my destination airport. So how do I best deal with that? 
we're going to select the profile view, which is the button to the right, tap that, and we are going to get a profile view of our flight. We're going to be climbing out of jackpot to 11,000 feet and then traveling to the southeast until we get near Vernal where we would start our descent. Except as you can see, that isn't going to work because we have mountaintops that are higher than 11,000 feet. So flying direct is absolutely impossible. So how do we deal with this? Well, one option obviously is we could fly higher if I was so prepared to, but to demonstrate that, if that were an option for you, you can grab that 11,000 foot altitude slider and slide it up like this and get above those mountains, say 16.5, and then everything is kind of clear. But as I stated earlier, my Cessna 182 doesn't have oxygen. My service ceiling is probably about at that level, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to alter my route. Let's go back down to 11,000 feet where we were. And I want to demonstrate the use of the ruler and we're going to actually uh, look for a way to do this. So before I do it, I'm going to try to help myself out. I should have done this earlier, but if you notice, my, the background of my map is just plain blue. I'm going to go ahead and go up to options, and I'm going to turn on some terrain. I want to see if this can assist, so I'm going to select colored terrain, and I'm also going to select peaks, passes, and cables. Now, peaks, passes, and cables are probably not going to be of much assistance here. That's primarily going to be visible mostly in Europe. But when you do get into mountainous and we, if we do zoom in, we may actually see some passes. So now the terrain gives me a little better idea of what it looks like. And as you can tell, uh, it might be a little easier to go around to the south. So in order to look at this, I'm going to use the two finger ruler. By placing two fingers on there, I can move this ruler around and I can see how the terrain or the on the profile view adjusts based on the ruler. I'm going to put the upper edge of the ruler at my turn where I turn from going east to the southeast. And I'm going to move this around and see where I can go to kind of get a little flatter type environment. So if I do something like this, this is looking pretty good right here. So let's try this. I'm going to let go. And by the way, if you notice, when I use and activate the ruler, the profile view changes to reflect the ruler. So if I let go, it's going to go back. It's going to hold the ruler. And now I'm going to rubber band to the point approximately where the ruler ended. So let's say it was right about here somewhere. And I'm going to let go and I'm going to select that point. And now I am in pretty good shape. I have taken the mountains out of play. And as you can see up here, I can have a normal descent. Now it does turn red and I might have some issues there on my descent into Vernal. But more than likely, it's because I am planning just from top of cruise to airport elevation with a standard descent. But if I enter into some type of procedure and stay high until I get closer to the airport, I can probably avoid that. Why do I make that comment? Because I looked at the 3D view and I know that the mountains are not real close to the airport. They're off in the distance. So I believe at this point in my flight planning exercise that I've got room to maneuver around the vernal area. But we're going to be cognizant and aware in the back of our mind that I've got to revisit that issue. When we did move that, though, we notice we have some airspace introduced. And this most likely is the Salt Lake City area. So I can tap on this and see, sure, in fact, that's the Salt Lake City Class Bravo airspace. I can do one of two things. I can either choose to go around that or I can communicate with air traffic control and try to get permission to fly through Class Bravo. But let's go ahead and move that and we'll rubber band around that and see if that has an impact on any issues here and it doesn't so i'm going to rubber band such something like that select that and now i have a pretty clean airway i'm pretty comfortable with this it didn't add a lot to my route and it took a lot of complexities out of it i'm going to hide the profile view 
we're going to go back and look at the entire route and take a look and see what we did. We avoided uh, military operational airspace uh, on our initial leg. We're avoiding Salt Lake City Class Bravo airspace, and we're going sufficiently to the south and then coming into the vernal area from the west-southwest uh, such that we're avoiding mountain tops that reach as high as 11,000 feet. Let's visit that profile view one more time, take a look. I'm pretty happy with that. I think that's a pretty good route. So I may file that, or if I'm flying VFR, I might file, uh, you know, fly such as that, or I would come up with a route that simulates that path, and I know I'm free of obstruction. So that, in a nutshell, is a good way to use profile view to help you select your route. And don't be afraid to use the ruler, as we did, Move that around, and that ruler can be your best friend when it comes to finding alternate routes. Okay, we've got our route here. We can turn that off. We're going to go back away from that. Let's take a look at, uh, we'll turn that off. We can go through the similar exercise as to what we did. Currently, do we have any weather advisories? Go through the various weather charts available to us. We don't see anything going on right there. Uh, you could be looking for turbulence, different areas, 30,000 feet that I used before. Let's slide that down. Let's grab a hold of that uh, altitude slider and try to uh, adjust it downwards. Down to 11 and see if there's any turbulence. Maybe a little bit as we come into vernal. Uh, we can play it. This is the kind of exercise you go through in enhancing the safety of your flight planning exercise. Okay, with that, let's move on. There's one other topic I wanna to cover real briefly and prior to actually preparing some details of our flight, and that is what I refer to as the EFB checklist. I'm going to guess that for most of you, this is brand spanking new, but I want you to think of it this way. We are all very comfortable with pulling out our op pilot operating handbook or pulling out a laminated card or most, more recently pulling out for flight and going to our checklist as we do our pre-flight checks of our aircraft. We go around and we check our lighting. We sump the tanks. We check the fuel. We uh, check all the hinges. We check for integrity of our struts. We do all sorts of things as covered by our, our checklist prior to flight. But do we ever take the time to check our iPad? If we're going to be dependent on our iPad for charts, for navigation, for in-flight information, if we're utilizing the ADSB, or for information that we pack prior to our flight, do you ever really take the time? I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you actually have a checklist for your iPad or your iPhone prior to taking flight? And if you did, do you know what's in there? Well, we have created one for you. And as a little homework assignment, I'm not exactly, I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is. I want each of you, when this webinar is over, to go out and find it. It's easy to find. And if you can't find it, email us at team at fourflight.com. Tell us you couldn't find it, and we'll give you explicit instructions where it is. But I've already got mine saved down here. It's called SWFC, Southwest Flying Club. That's a club that I'm a member of. And this is my EFB checklist. And I'm not going to take a lot of time to go through this because I encourage you to go through it yourself and become familiar with what we built for you. We have charging. We have data checks. We have flight planning checks. And we have final actions. I'm going to suggest also that those steps that we've put into the prefabricated checklist are not enough for you that there are going to be some steps that you're going to want to take to add to your checklist. So this checklist can be modified and edited to your liking, just like any other checklist can. So I encourage you to build one for yourself and then to use your EFB pre-flight for every flight. Let me give you a tip or two that I think enhances safety that ought to be on your pre-flight checklist. When's the last time you rebooted your iPad? Which means turned it off and then turned it back on. That helps clear out the memory caches and things of that order. 
Shutting down your iPad or your iPhone periodically is a good thing. I'm not suggesting you do it every hour. I'm not even suggesting you do it every day. But periodically, something that you think works for you probably is a worthwhile exercise. Here's another tip. Clear out all the apps that you don't need when you go flying. If I go to the home page, if I double click the home button, here's the apps that I have. I obviously have four flight open, but I have my calendar. I have mail. I've got the app store. I've got text messages. I've got settings. I'm swiping all those up and getting rid of them so that the only thing that's going on on my iPad is four flight. It is not so important today as it has been in the past, but I will suggest that it is important if you're using an older iPad that you conserve as much memory and resources on your iPad when you go flying as possible. And probably the best way to do that is to shut down all unneeded apps, and that's the way you do it. One step further, make those actions part of your checklist, your EFB checklist. Let's move on to the next section of our webinar, and that's going to be procedure briefing. We've got our flight here going from jackpot to vernal, and it's time to decide what uh, type of approach procedure that we're going to select into vernal. Now, I think most of you probably know how to do this, and that is we're going to use procedure advisor. We're going to select approach, and in this case, we've only got two approaches. We've got three, but all are for runway 35. So, We've got a GPS WAS-capable aircraft. We're going to select the RNAV-35. And since we're kind of coming in from the west, and it's possible that we might have to execute a procedure turn, we're going to go ahead and set OHAPE as our initial approach effect, and we're going to add that to our route. And we'll decide in talking to air traffic control if, in fact, we need to make the procedure turn or if we do not. But for the time being, let's assume that we're going to fly the entire approach, and we are going to do that. So we've added that to our, our route. Now we have overlaid that on the map, as you can tell. If you can, we can hide the flight plan. And if we want to go full screen, we type that gear icon at the top. We can view that plate full screen and we can do that. And now we've got the plate shown full screen. If we want to go back, we can just close it and we were back to the way we are. And I'm sure most of you probably know that you can adjust the opacity of the plate, make it more transparent by moving it to the left, uh, make it almost where it's completely dominant and you have almost no opacity through here, and that's to the right. I also want to draw one other safety feature, and that is if you notice on many maps and many plates and diagrams, we've got this invert plate colors. If you're flying at night, this type of presentation may not work for your eyes best, so if you tap that, the plate will actually revert in this case because we're looking at the map If at the for the plate. If you wanted to go back and do that for the map, there. Now, one thing about approach plates. We get a lot of people asking us, and this is all part of the pre-flight pre preparation about how to best organize your approach plates, especially if there are a lot of them. So in this case, let's use Vernal as an example. And I'm going to go ahead and prepare in case I were to change, have to change procedures. I'm going to go ahead and prepare a binder in my plates tab for Vernal, Utah. So I'm going to hit the plus and I'll type in K-V-E-L and I'm going to save that. And in this, I'm going to add the plate. So I tap add plate. And if you notice, it knows, ForeFlight knows, all the recent airports that you've been dealing with. And so Vernal is a choice here. I can just type Vernal and I can go through here and decide what I want to add to my binder for plates. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add the airport information and I'm going to add the airport uh, diagram. It's been added. I'm going to add both RNAV procedures and I'm also going to add the VOR. I'm done with that. And so therefore, when I'm in the map view and I need to go, let's just say this weren't even here, I'm going to hide that. And if I wanted to just pull up the plate, I go to plates, I'm in Vernal, and I can tap immediately the RNAV Y procedure runway 35. 
Now, a lot of people say, well, what if I want to flip back and forth between multiple plates of diagrams? This is all part of the organization process. Prior to your flight, put these in whatever order you want. You can edit them. You can move them around. So you drag them and move them like such. Let's say that's done. And then once you're in one, if you want to swipe uh, from one plate to the next, using three fingers, this is called the three finger grab, put three fingers on the screen and just swiped left or right. And you will go from plate to plate in your binder as such, moving back and forth. If I want to quickly go back to the map, to, to, uh, touch the map button at the bottom, go back to the plates, there's your plate. If I want to go to the next one, three fingers, so on and so forth. You can navigate in and around ForeFlight very, very quickly, even if you're di in different tabs. So try that out. Practice that at home. So back to the maps. We're going to be flying the approach. We're all set up now, and we want to... Um, well, uh, now we're at the point where we need to pre-flight or brief that approach plate. So let's pull it up. Let's pull that RNAV 3.5 Y procedure up. And I'm going to suggest to you that you make use of the annotation feature in preparing these plates. Now, don't do this in the air, but I would do this in advance. I think it's a very helpful tab. If you have not used the annotation feature, try it out. The pencil in the upper hand left corner turns it on. And in this case, we got the pencil and it gives us the ability to draw on the plate such as this. So I may do it and I want to pre-flight it. Here's my ASOS frequency. Here's Salt Lake City, who I may be talking to. Um, here's my Unicom frequency. This is very important. I have chosen green. You can choose whatever color you want. Uh, the Minimum altitude, 7,200 feet, right here at Riage, which is the final approach fix, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to take the time to brief the entire plate, but I frequently will use annotations in advance to draw attention to things that I'm going to need to know when the time becomes near. And obviously, you're going to have you know, things like your... Um, minimum distances and you're going to cross OHAPE at 10,000 feet and 7,200 feet, so on and so forth. So use the annotation feature and when you leave the, that plate and you go to something else, it's going to save it. So if I go to that plate or even go back to the maps and then go back to the plate, I'm going to close that, go to the, to the plate that I annotated right there and the annotations have been preserved. That's annotations. And that's the best way to prepare your plate for briefing when you're getting ready to do your in-flight briefing on your approach procedure. Last thing I want to demonstrate, demonstrate on this flight is I'm going to go back to 3D view. And to do this, I'm going to tap the flight plan and I'm going to tap 3D. Now, this is a performance feature, but I now have the ability to view this entire flight in 3D before I even make it. So down here in the lower left hand corner you've got a couple things. Right now I've got the cockpit view highlighted. If I wanted the 3D view, I'm sorry, the third person view where I'm outside the airplane kind of trailing the airplane and watching the flight, uh, I can select that. This is the play button. I'm, I'm actually viewing this at 20x which is 20 times. You can see it's got an excellent view of the train. I took off from jackpot. We're going out. I can speed this up if, and for purpose of demonstration, just grab the time bar at the bottom and you will see down here the critical points. So we're coming up on my turn. Watch carefully as I get to the turn. Now remember, we had military airspace off to the right. And as I get to this waypoint, I'm going to turn to the south and you're going to see that the airport just the aircraft just turned. So now I'm proceeding ahead. If you want to fast forward, you can use this here and come to points like that. And I fast forward to this point and it took me ahead. Now I'm one hour into the flight. I can grab this time. And I wanted to demonstrate as we're getting closer. Let's go as we get closer to OHAPE. And I want to demonstrate how it's going to fly the procedure in 3D view. Give you a little vision. 
as to what you're doing. Also notice the altitude at the top left. We're starting to, our descent down it to our initial approach fix at OHAPE. And so we're coming up on that. I'm going to speed it up just a little, get a little closer. Purpose of demonstrating. It should turn out motor bound and fly the procedure turn because I instructed it accordingly. And there we go. We're off to the right. We're flying the procedure turn. We're now outbound on the uh, approach course. Getting ready to do the procedure turn. Here's the turn to the right. We're still at 10,000 feet. Remember my minimum crossing altitude as shown in the upper right when we cross OHAPE inbound is 10,000 feet. And we're coming up on OHAPE again and we're inbound. Now we're going to be begin our descent. Coming up on our final approach fix. And we're going to cross it at 7,200 feet, and then we're going to be descending down to the runway. And this is 3D view, an entire review of our flight. Very powerful feature to use in planning and preparing your flight. The last features I want to demonstrate in our pre-flight preparation are the new, fairly new takeoff and landing performance calculations that we now provide in for flight, as well as the generation of a nav log and briefing and filing if you choose to go that route. So in order to access those features, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to send your flight plan over to flights. To do so, hit the send to box at the lower right hand corner and choose flights. And that will take that flight plan and everything we built into it over to the flights page, as you can see here. Let's take a look at the takeoff and landing calculations. If you notice in the departure line and the destination line where we have jackpot and vernal, we've got a box that says takeoff and a box that says landing. Let's look at takeoff first. Now, at the present time, this is only available for single engine pistons. But be patient. It's coming as we build our not only the technology that it takes to perform more complex calculations for turboprops and twins, and certainly for jets, but also build out our library of aircraft. But the features are going to be similar. If you go to takeoff, it's assuming that we're going to be leaving runway 15. It gives you all the important parameters here, and then down at the bottom are the calculations for the uh, uh, that it takes to get off the ground there. And that's all based upon the weight and the amount of fuel and the weather at the time, all the factors associated with the environment that is surrounding my aircraft, my Cessna 182 at jackpot upon takeoff, as well as the conditions of the aircraft that I told it. One thing I wanted to point out specifically is right here in the middle is the safety distance factor. This is user selectable. So if 1.0 is not acceptable, and I think for most people they want to build in a factor of something, in this case I'm going to build in a 50% factor and I'm going to use 1.5. So if you enter that, it will refresh all the calculations and come up with new distances and new speeds in order to get off the runway there at jackpot. If you go back, and now we're going to do vernal, the destination, we're going to look at the runway, ca uh, the landing calculations. Okay, this is for landing runway 35. Notice that if we wanted to, or were landing runway 17, we could select that, and it would refresh the calculations, even though it told me this is probably not the favorable scenario. And we go ahead and refresh it and did that. So I'm going back to runway, or we're at runway 35. And you notice that right now we don't have any significant wind going on there direction. So I would interpret that as being variable at four knots. Atmospheric pressure 30.07. And it's calculating the, the distances uh, required. 1,544 feet total distance to overcome that 50 foot obstacle and get on the ground and stopped. So again, there's our safety factor. Let's take, take this time that I wanted a 100% safety factor. So I'm gonna put in a safety factor of 2.0 and those distances roughly doubled. 
That's our runway performance model. Takeoff and landing distance is demonstrated for our flight here today. Go back to the front uh, of the flights page. Uh, we're not going to go through the flight planning exercises of fuel policy and weights and payloads. For those of you that have performance level subscriptions, fuel policy, as you know, is the type of fuel uh, calculations that you want to make, whether it be minimum fuel, maximum fuel, so on and so forth. But I do want to generate a nav log, and this is a statistical presentation of all the flight calculations that I need for my flight. You notice, and everybody should be familiar with this, it includes also diagrams for your departure airport and your destination airport. In this one, there is not one available for jackpot, but there certainly is for Vernal in this particular case. There's also plenty of blank spots for you to print this out. If you so choose, take it with you on your clipboard or your kneeboard, take notes, things like that. If you do want to print it out, the send to button at the top and print is an option down below. Let's back out of this and we're going to generate the briefing. And this takes a minute to generate. And as everybody knows, it is always smart to generate a briefing. Our briefing starts with the nav log, but then we get down into our weather briefings. This is the graphical PDF briefing, which happens to be my personal favorite. We also have a graphical HTML briefing that is a different presentation. It largely contains the same information. You've got weather charts, uh, you've got METARs, TAFs uh, of airports of interest in route. You got SIGMETs and AIRMETs, NOTAMs, so on and so forth. Down here, there's the NOTAMs down at the bottom. It's very important that you generate a briefing for two reasons. One is that you are required by statutes to have all available information available for your flight. Now, there's a misnomer amongst most people. There is no such thing as a legal briefing or illegal briefing. You are required to generate a briefing and gather all necessary information prior to your flight. And you do that by a briefing. We keep records of whether or not you generate a briefing. People ask us frequently, do you have a copy of the briefing I generated? And the answer is if you generated one, we will keep it on our servers. If you're going to file, you hit the proceed to file button down here at the bottom. It will take you to the file page. We're not going to do that right now, but that is the uh, entry point into the, the um, filing process. So that in a nutshell is how you generate a briefing, generate a briefing. We also have other features up here if you want to attach files to that particular flight or if you get any messages, namely after if you file, if there's been an amendment from air traffic control to your route or any new weather advisories, things like that, they're going to show up there. So that concludes the majority or all of our pre-flight preparation. Next, we're going to move to the in-flight tools that you can use to enhance your safety and in-flight decision-making capability with the use of ForeFlight. We're going to move now to tools that you can use while in flight. Tools that will be helpful in enhancing your decision-making ability and your in-flight safety. Many of these are going to be tools that uh, you have seen and may be very skilled at. Some of the, these tools may be brand new to you, so I encourage you to take a look and hopefully that everybody will have a takeaway from it. First one we're going to talk about is synthetic vision. In this uh, example, you'll see that I've got synthetic vision on the left side of the screen with my map overlay on the right. The green line that encircles my current location is the Glide Advisor. We'll talk more about Glide Advisor here in just a few minutes. But let's focus on synthetic vision on the left. This gives us a view as if we were looking forward out of the cockpit uh, of the terrain and things going on around us. If there was traffic in the area, we'd see traffic. If there were obstacles, we'd see obstacles, things like that. You've got the ability, as we scroll through, to uh, look around as well. Now, for purposes of timing and demonstration, I don't have glance uh, mode turned on, but if I were to grab a hold of that synthetic vision and, drift to, to, and drag it to the left or the right, you'd see a little pie appear, and it would actually 
essentially turn its head and look to the left or the right at what is off that direction. And that's a direction different than I'm currently traveling. Once I let go, it'll time out in six seconds, it'll go back to look ahead mode. So that's synthetic vision. Now on the right, you can see a top view and you can see how the two kind of compare to each other. I got the airport ahead of me and I also have terrain off in the distance on the left. And you can see that in the synthetic vision if you look carefully. Here's another view. Uh, you also notice that we've got the uh, altitude and the speed tapes and the descent tapes going all for based from the information I'm getting from my AHARS feed. So you have to have AHARDS for this to be functional. In this case, we're using a Sentry and we're feeding the AHARS data into ForeFlight and it's presenting us with live synthetic vision data. You can use that all the way down to the runway as indicated here, landing at uh, Northern Colorado Regional. I encourage you to give that a try if you have an in-flight and learn how to set it up while you're couch flying with ForeFlight. It's a tremendous safety and situational awareness feature that is available for Pro Plus subscribers and above. Let's go back to profile view. We talked a lot about profile view in our in-flight preparation, but now we can use profile view while we're in flight. Here's an example of us flying along and you see that the presentation of the profile view is just a little bit different want to draw attention to a few of those features that do differ. As you can see, it highlighted in the magenta is some important statistics about the highest point that we've got along the route and the clearance that we're going to encounter. In this case, we're well above at 1170 feet, so there is no first strike opportunity. But if we were less than that, or if we were actually below that point, then you would be alerted as to when the first strike might occur. We also are getting presentation of what our altitudes are. In this case, we're 8846 uh, above sea level and 1396 above ground level. We're also getting a distance tape, so we know kind of how far everything is out in front of us. And we've also got the ability to adjust the width of our corridor so that we are looking at profiles a certain distance on either side of us. Now we had that capability in our in-flight pre-flight planning as well. I just didn't take the time and demonstrate it, but I want to demonstrate it to you here. So if you tap that, you can select the corridor total width. In this case, the total width is four miles. That's going to be two miles on either side. Now obviously, if you're not interested in that, if you are very comfortable with the ability to fly and stay on course, you may want to tighten that up or you can widen it out to say 20 nautical miles, which would be 10 on either side, to give you a much wider corridor to alert you to possible ground hazards that could exist. You also, if you tap hazard attitudes down below, you will get the ability to adjust those. Now the normal altitude is 100 feet above and 1,000 feet below. Helicopters obviously are different because they're very accustomed to flying closer to the ground. So you are not going to uh, probably adjust this for fixed wing flight other than the normal hazard altitude setting. You also, while you're in flight, have the ability to use the ruler. Now we went into great detail on the use of the ruler in our pre-flight preparation, so I'm not gonna cover that here now. But remember that if you use the ruler that the profile will adjust and show you the profile along the path of the ruler and not the path of your flight, as indicated here. Let's go back to the Hazard Advisor, a very powerful feature that was introduced a year or two ago. And if you have in a potential situation where you're going to encounter terrain coming up, this pop-up will immediately present itself to grab your attention. You can take this full screen by tapping this, the blue, or you can dismiss it by tapping the dismiss box immediately to the left of that. And it shows you essentially a, uh, a 120 degree view, uh, not only straight ahead, but probably 60 degrees off to either side, as well as a distance ring, two nautical miles in this case, as to what kind of train you've got. So this is giving you a warning 
that you have hazard that set ahead. And that's what we set in the previous slide as well. Let's talk about in-flight alerts. I think most people probably have these set up and there's been a growing number of alerts that can be enabled by you, the user, to alert when something is either available or getting ready to occur. I'm not going to show you all the examples, but I do want to show you a few as to how they work. Here's the presentation of the uh, AWOS frequency for our arrival airport where we're going to be uh, uh, landing here shortly. It pops up, it gives you uh, uh, a reminder of what that frequency is, in this case 135.075. Here's a, an alert that you're on two nautical mile final for runway 33. And as you can see, we're getting close to the ground, so the train has turned yellow. You have a lot of things going on, but it's actually indicating to you that you're lined up and approximately how far you are from short final for that runway. And of course, maybe a very critical one that I always encourage people to have is that we have a 500 foot AGL alert as well. Indicates that you're 500 feet above the ground level. So let's talk about how we activate these alerts. It's up to you to decide if you want to turn them on or not. If you go to your settings uh, and scroll down near the bottom, you'll get down to the preference sections and at the very top, you will see alerts. Tap that box in order to enter the alert setup page. And in there, we've got a lot of alerts. They're all listed one by one. And there's actually uh, probably 15 or so, and I'm gonna show you all. The first one though, is speak all alerts. These alerts come with voice. And so you not only will get a visual description on your iPad or your iPhone, but you'll also get it in your headset or over the speaker if you're connected saying, things like 500 above ground level or approaching runway or approaching uh, short final, two nautical mile final, things like that. You toggle these on or off, blue means on, and you can see them listed here, 500 AG, foot AGL, cabin altitude alerts, transition altitudes, proximity to runway, final approach alerts, sink rates, terrain, traffic alerts, so on and so forth. We've gone beyond that also to indicate if you have an external device such as a Stratus or a Sentry and you're disconnected during flight for one reason or another that you will sound an alert to make you aware that that external device is no longer connected. In addition, if that device gets low on battery power, you're gonna get an alert there too. Scrolling down a little further, we have uh, destination weather frequency alerts. I showed you that a minute ago. And then we get down into the TFR section. And you can get TFR alerts that will alert you that you are coming or approaching a TFR, uh, either at altitude or you may be above it or below it. And you set the above and below altitudes in the altitude buffer, which is uh, shown on the bottom line. The way that works is if, the, uh, let's say a TFR is up to 10,000 feet and you're flying uh, along at 11,000 feet and you have a 2,000 foot buffer, you will still get an alert that you are above that TFR and that there is an active TFR going on below you. If you're going to be flying straight into a TFR, you'll be getting an alert that you will be flying into that. Next is Glide Advisor. Excellent feature to have set up. I encourage everyone to set it up on every aircraft that, that they have in their portfolio. The way you do that is go into the aircraft setup. By the way, point out that in 12.4, we've uh, reestablished uh, the, the way that the iPad can be set up. And in this case, if you notice, we have a whole different type of toolbar down below with all our tabs are rearranged and set up. I put aircraft down there and I have uh, settings and the more along the right hand side. So give 12.4 a look. It's an exciting advance in multitasking and user setup for their for flight experience. So we're back to Glide Advisor. We're going to set it up in aircraft and we're going to set up the best glide speed and the best glide ratio. You will get that data from your pilot operating handbook. 
Glide speed, obviously, is pretty self-explanatory. I think everybody knows what that is. The best glide ratio may not be intuitively obvious from reading your POH, but you should be able to ascertain a very reasonable value. It's basically the distance that you can glide over the distance that you lose. So that's going to generally be a number somewhere, say, between 8 and 12. Obviously, there's going to be exceptions for poor performing aircraft or higher, better performing aircraft in glide mode. And once you set up, that's where you would enter it. And once you set it up, then you can go to your options while you're in map mode and turn on your glide advisor. Obviously, as you know, that the settings are found in the gear icon at the top. Tap that, go to glide advisor, turn it on, and then you will get the presentation. You will also get a reminder of what your settings are in the settings pop-up window as well as the blue box displayed in the lower right-hand corner. Now, the Glide Advisor, I think, as most people know, will not be a perfect circle because it is taking into account winds as ForeFlight knows it, depending on the wind data that you have made available to you as well as the terrain. So if we were in mountainous terrain and we had um, obstacles along either side of us, then it might distort the shape of that circle one direction or another to know that your best landing opportunities are going to be off to the left or off to the right, so on and so forth. So give that a look. We've got some excellent videos on our support page on our website that show and explain how Glide Advisor works and describe in greater detail some of the distortion that I'm talking about when you're in terrain other than just flat land environments such as where I live. Last thing I really want to talk about in detail is the ADSB products that we have available, namely the weather. ADSB has come a long ways and now if you have access to ADSB through either an external device such as our Sentry or through your panel transponder, you have access to get a long list of products while in flight. AirMet, SigMet, Center Weather Advisories, CloudTop Information, Flight Categories, Lightning, METARs, NEXRAD Radar, NOTAMs, PIREPs, Sky Coverages, TAFs, Temperature Lofts, TFRs, and Turbulence. It is worth noting that a lot of people are asking about icing Icing has not been widely released yet. There is still some beta testing going on, so you might see icing on occasion uh, if you're seeing screenshots or information provided by another user. But for the most part, the general public does not have access to icing because of some technical difficulties the FAA is having with that. To access your ADSB products, you're going to go to your overlay selector. And in this case, we've got Radar Composite pulled up. And if you scroll down, you're going to see some of the other choices, such as Cloud Tops. And it's denoted with ADSB afterwards in parentheses. Here's Turbulence. Here's the freezing levels. Here's our Air Met, Sig Mets, and Center Weather Advisors. We talked in greater detail about the in-flight preparation, but we have uh, an example of that here is coming from the ADSB, winds aloft, temperatures, and PIREPs. Now we'll take a look at the PIREPs. PIREPs sometimes can be sporadic. There is not a way to turn in a PIREP by using ForeFlight while in flight. That has to be done via the radio. But if you tap on that pi rep, you will get a reading as to what that pi rep represents. And in this case, this is a pi rep over the southeast part of Houston, and it was turned in 53 minutes ago. Here's an example of getting the METARs along with the temperature data. And you can get the information by going to your airports page, getting the feed via the ADSB. Now, there's a whole lot more information about how the ADSB system works. Uh, common, common question is how often does it refresh? How current is the data? How soon do I see it? What's the lapse rate? Things like that. I encourage you to get those answers 
by visiting our support page at www.forflight.com slash support and just search on ADSB and you will see a very, very long list of articles that provide detailed technical information as to the specifics of how ADSB works for you and how it interacts with ForeFlight. That concludes the topics that we wanted to cover in our decision making and in-flight safety. We hope this is very helpful. As always, we want to draw attention to the fact that there is much more information that we have available in a, in a variety of places. The first one is the pilot's guide. I encourage everybody to access the pilot's guide. Give it a look every once in a while. Don't let it be a foreign document to you. And you can get it one of two places. You can get it online at www.forflight.com, or it's available to you with an app. If you go to documents, and then tap catalog, and then tap for flight, and then you can down it as well as several other documents directly onto your iPad and read them at your convenience. We also have a very exhaustive uh, list of videos in our video library. We release new videos every time new features come out. So I encourage you to take a look at those. And I tell people that most of the videos are probably five or six minutes long at most, so they quickly grab your attention, they stay focused on the topic that you're interested in, then they end and you can go on and view other videos. You don't have to do a lot of searching within a video to get answers to your question. Of course, please always feel free to reach out to our pilot support team at team at foreflight.com if you ever have any problems, difficulties, or have any questions that you need to have answered. I'm certain that this webinar that you've attended today has probably stimulated some questions, maybe some intrigue and how things work a little more in detail. Maybe there's some confusion, maybe you've identified a problem, so on and so forth. The best way to get a hold of us is to email us at team at fourflight.com. I and about 25 of my colleagues, that's what we do. We live to help pilots uh, with their four flight experience. And of course, stay tuned that we're gonna have more webinars coming to you shortly on this channel, which is foreflight.com, part of the pilot and command series. So it's back slash, uh, forward slash PIC. And we have our other one, foreflight on frequency for foreflight.com forward slash on frequency. Stay tuned for more of the information. And with that, we're gonna go into our live Q&A session. All right. This is Phil Inman coming to you from Houston, Texas. We're live, it's 1240 Central Time on Wednesday. Many thanks to those of you that stuck with us through those technical problems. We'll get those figured out and uh, hopefully make the uh, audio issue a uh, thing of the past for future webinars. So with that, let's jump into it. But before I get to the first question, I do wanna make a comment in the webinar. You saw me demonstrate the three finger grab uh, while moving between plates in plate view. With our release of version 12.4 yesterday, we have come to identify that there is an inconsistency problem on three-figure work, grab working sometimes and not working others. So if you uh, do experience a problem with the three-finger grab, uh, don't be panicked, don't alarm, we are aware of it and we will be fixing that problem soon. It is not intended to go away, it will be a feature and a capability available to you. Apologies for that inconvenience. Uh, as far as accessing this recording for future viewing, yes, we will have it up on our website at www.forflight.com slash PIC very soon, probably later today or tomorrow at the latest. Appreciate all the questions that have come in. There's been a lot of them, a lot of very good ones, so I want to jump right into them. We could only have about 15 minutes to answer questions. I'll see what we can do. The first one I want to address, do you have a list of recommended emergency scenarios that should be prepared to avoid bad spontaneous decisions? That was a discussion we had with Richard McSpadden of AOPA and me when I did that interview. And I think the best way to answer that is that I'm going to defer to the pilot operating handbook for your aircraft as being the best source of emergency scenarios for your aircraft. Now in four flight, if you look at the checklist that we build, 
or that you build for your particular aircraft, we do have emergency checklists in there. But we always want to maintain consciousness that the POH is the Bible for your aircraft. And that is the source, the go-to source when it comes to emergency scenarios. So I'm going to defer to that document uh, and recommend that you start there and then maybe take a look or build something within four flight as it relates to emergency scenarios. Excellent question. Thank you for sending it. Should four flight have some sort of flight planning checklist where you make sure that you plan some or all of the steps, such as weight and balance, fuel, weather, things like that, and then check those off for the flight? That's a great question. It feeds right into what I introduced when that is the EFP checklist. I gave everybody a little assignment to go out and find that. We got several questions come in saying, from people that they were successful in finding it and they were ready to load it up and customize it to their air, own aircraft. And that's exactly what we want you to do. So things like weight and balance, fuel, weather, uh, the physical condition of the airplane, the physical condition of your iPads, things like that, all your pre-flight activities can be customized there in addition to your aircraft checklist. And maybe one further thought is maybe you take what's in the EFB checklist and you customize your aircraft checklist with the contents of that. So those are all used or customizable. We built those so that you can make them uh, useful and the most practical for you. Related to weather, what's the delay in the weather data, the non-ADSB weather? Every one of the weather uh, sources or uh, thoughts that come in weather, whether it be radar or icing or turbulence all have different time frames but for internet weather uh, most of the radar images from north america and australia update every five minutes uh, the radar images in europe update about every 15 minutes i encourage you to go to foreflight.com go to our support center and type in questions related to weather updates say whether it be icing or radar or turbulence or reps or anything like that. And we've got a long list of articles that will give you specific refresh times and update times for each of those products. Continuing with weather, a question was asked, what is the difference between the US and global in the icing and turbulence section of the maps options? And those are great, If you know, great question. If you notice, we have two turbulence overlays, one US and one global. And they use different modeling techniques, which result in different forecasts. Let me explain. The US model is based on NOAA's graphical turbulence guidance, whereas the global turbulence layer is derived from the global forecast system. Now, one of these, and it's the global layer, differs from the US labor layer in that the turbulence layer forecasts include clear air turbulence, but do not include wave turbulence. Now, there's more information you can find there on that topic in our support center or another location is if you go to four flight blog and you get to the blog from fourflight.com our website and look for the article saying more turbulence is better i'm told that there is a fairly exhaustive discussion about that very topic so take a look at that i quickly showed how to hide the airspace above a user wanted to know that he missed it how do i do that can i please explain so when you have the aeronautical map layer activated uh, and visible on the map, tap on the map settings, which is the gear icon at the top, and then tap on airspace. And I think it's about the fourth option down, you will see an option to hide the airspace above a certain altitude, and then you set your own altitude. And that's how you do it. Questions asked, how do I activate the altitude slider on the right side of the weather layers? Well, keep in mind that the altitude slider only applies to certain weather products, such as turbulence and icing and things like that. So if you are on the appropriate weather product, that altitude slider will appear on its own on the right. And of course, you've got the time slider uh, independent of it, but that will appear on the bottom. So for those weather layers, take turbulence, for example, you will have two sliders, one on the bottom and one on the right side. What do we suggest to find out the age of the 3D view imagery? Uh, 
excellent observation by the user that emailed that question in is that not all the 3D imagery that we get from our third party provider is up to date. In fact, I have seen reports of images as new as a couple weeks because people will say, we just built this taxiway at our airport you know, six weeks ago and the image already shows it. And then the next person will email from some other airport and said, we built that taxiway five years ago and we still don't show it. Unfortunately, we're at the discretion of our third party provider and there is no direct way to identify the age of those images within four flight. If you do notice an error or something that is grossly out of date, please email us at team at fourflight.com. We love getting pie wraps on errors or inconsistencies or stale data, or in this case, stale images that are old. And we will be happy to investigate and try to uh, get to the bottom of it. But thank you, it's a great question. We do get reports periodically of things being old or not accurate. And we do rely heavily on our pilot community, those folks just like you, to help us identify those. Uh, this gentleman missed the ruler. How do I get to the ruler? All you have to do is just tap on the ruler and it should appear while you're in map view. Use two fingers and then slide those two fingers around. If you have any confusions about some of the uh, intricacies about how the ruler works, go to the pilot's guide for four fly. I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of cruising through the pilot's guide periodically, not only when new features are introduced and you want to learn more, but if there's something that just doesn't appear right or you're not sure exactly how it's functioning, start with the pilot's guide. It's gotten quite long, but the search capability within your iPad or on your computer is excellent. You type in a few key search words. In this case, type in the word ruler and you will get every instance of ruler appearing in that long guide and it really cuts down the search time. Next question, what is the 256 foot clearance referencing uh, that appeared when I was demonstrating the profile view? This is an excellent question. It is actually kind of a complex answer. Uh, the clearance value that you see is calculated for climb, cruise, and descent along your route within the corridor that you set, and I showed you how to set the corridor width. But it does exclude the flight portion, which is within five nautical miles of both your departure airport and your destination airport. Now, if you're flying over relatively flat terrain like we down, do down here in Southeast Texas, uh, the calculated lowest clearance value may be a point along your route where the cruise or the descent or the climb actually crosses that five nautical mile ring around your airport. So uh, be cognizant of that. We also do use the current winds uh, for your time of departure plus the tip length, uh, trip length. And those are the winds that you have packed into your four flight prior to departure or if you're getting ASD winds during flight from our global winds model. So it may actually vary that clearance based on the wind forecast at your departure and destination airport. So it's kind of a complex answer to a straightforward question. So just be aware of that five nautical mile ring and the fact that winds are being taken into account. Is there a way to have multiple altitudes shown in profile view? No, not at this time. We're hoping that that's going to be done in the near future. Just to give the question a little depth, you can plan multiple altitudes in your flight plan, and it will show in your flight plan, but when you go to profile view right now, you're only going to see one altitude. It will be a straight line across the top. I anticipate that will change in the future. Question is, how do you keep the list of overlays open when looking at the map view? In settings, which you access by going to more and then settings, go to layer selector and then tap multiple selections. And that will give you the ability to select multiple overlay layers while you're in maps view and should stay open until such time as you go back to the map and start doing there, in which case your overlay box will close and you'll have to reopen. Is the weather automatically updated for the takeoff and landing calculations? Excellent question. Uh, for many of you, this may have been the first time that you saw takeoff and landing calculations provided, and that's at the present time only provided for single engine testings. 
But the answer to the question is yes. Uh, we will compute the uh, takeoff result and landing performance calculations based on the airport's METAR, the TAF, or the MOS forecast nearest to the estimated takeoff time or landing time. If there is not one available, we're going to use the closest airport to the one that you are either departing from or arriving at. And the weather information will be automatically supplied by either the internet, ADSB, or Sirius XM weather. So we're taking that weather information from all three of those feeds. Uh, I had a follow-up question to that and said, does the runway calculations take into account density altitude? And yes, density altitude or the pressure altitude is corrected for temperature effects. And yes, it is factored when computing the takeoff and landing performance results. Most performance charts that you're going to see correct for pressure altitude and for outside air temperature, which together, that factors into the density altitude calculation. Very good question. Thank you. I mentioned it in the webinar, and we were asked again. We get asked this periodically. Does the four-flight weather briefing that you generate in flight planning, does that count as our official weather and the answer is that the FARs only require that pilots obtain all available information. And if you want to look it up, that's FAR 91.103. We deliver, we being ForeFlight, delivers weather, notams, et cetera, that help you meet that requirement, especially when you're obtaining a briefing from the file in the brief system. So yes, it goes a long ways into the pilot obtaining all available information. And while this particular person didn't ask, I will tell you that if you generate a briefing, we keep record of the fact that you generated a briefing in our system, should anybody ask down the road. So that constitutes the need uh, to get a briefing and there's no need to really go to any other source other than for flight, unless you feel that we're not providing you something that you need to have for your briefing. And if that's the case, we want you to write into us and tell us that. Do I need to change any settings to get a graphical briefing? And the answer is yes. You set this, the preferred briefing type by going to more and then settings. Look for the line that says briefing type and then select graphical PDF. And then you're going to have to get out of that flight plan and come back in for it to take effect. I think that. Uh, wraps up. Oh, here's one more I'll just bring up. Uh, in the briefing, does the vertical cross-section chart represent vertical winds by the wind bars? That's a fairly complex answer, and it's actually a fairly complex chart, but once you get familiar with it, it's, it's extremely powerful and useful. The best thing I recommend is that we have written an excellent article. I've gone to it myself in our support center on our website. Go to the support center, type in vertical cross-section chart, and we have charts and a description of what each of those designates on that chart. So it's worth a visit, and you may even want to read it more than once and understand it. I think once you get familiar with that chart, you're really going to like it. So that kind of wraps up our Q&A for today. Uh, it's been a long session. We had great attendance. We thank you for being here, and we want you to stay tuned towards for future webinars that we're going to have. This is something that's been hugely popular. We have more topics on the drawing board. We have some in the making. There's going to be some already on the, the uh, schedule that you can see by visiting our website. This webinar today is part of our Pilots and Command series. So you go to forflight.com slash PIC. But please visit our other one. It's called Four Flight on Frequency, found on our website as well for a list of other webinars. And of course, we still continue to add video series uh, and, and, and videos to our library. Every time we have a release, uh, please update to 12.4. It was released yesterday. It's an extremely robust release with a bunch of new features. This is not a subtle release. This is very significant. And I am absolutely convinced the pilot community is going to be well, well excited about uh, what we've provided here. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for attending. Thank you for staying to the end and the patience through our technical problems. We will get that worked out. 
And everybody have a great day. And thank you once again for being part of the Fourth Life Connect family.